So first of all, I want to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me to this uh, very uh, nice conference. So what I'm going to talk about is the uh, possible breakdown of regularity for 3D homogeneous incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. So uh, let me recall the uh, the equation that DTU, the unknown, is a 3D vector field and the and the pressure. So here U and sometimes I will use this is a 3D vector. So there is an horizontal part. The first two components are considered are horizontal, and the third one is considered as a vertical. And X also in R3. So X will be XH, X3. So we are working in R3. So we neglect a very no boundary. So this will allow us to compute the pressure, which will be useful at some point. There is a diversion-free condition, and there is also an initial data. Okay. So the question is, it's in study, it's very well known, it's well posed because of the conservation of energy, and in 3D, let me, uh, uh, one thing which is very important for the well posed is the scaling. So the scaling property, and this will be important in all these talks, that there is the scaling for this equation, that if u is a solution on a time interval 0 t, then u lambda t of x, which is lambda t square, is solution, solution on 0 lambda minus 2 t. Okay, this is very easy to check. And this is one of the main feature of the equation. This is really very important, the scaling invariance. And so what let me give in 3D some example of scaling invariance spaces for uh, space 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 time. The LP in time with LQ in X with the relation with this relation. This is scaling invariant. This is very easy to check. Or something like by a uh, slightly smaller space, but which is also useful for this. This is 1 half plus 2 over p for p between 1 and infinity, including infinity. Okay. And there is a, a, a now classical theorem that uh, has some roots in the wor work of Leray and work of Fujita Kato and so on. The first basic theorem that take into account the, the, the scaling, that if you consider an initial data in H one half, so in this talk, all the spaces a priori they are on R three and they are homogeneous in spite of the fact I don't put the dot here. All the spaces I consider they are homogeneous ones. Okay. So this is easy to see that this is scaling invariant. This is included in L three and L three. This is scaling invariant for the initial data. And there is a, a maximal time of existence, T star, of a solution, U, U is a solution, which is continuous with value in H one half, and, and U is also locally L2 with value in H three over two. Okay? And if the initial data is small, then t star equals to plus infinity. And what the, the purpose of this talk is to describe something, what happens if t star is finite. So if t star is always plus infinity, uh, I'm afraid this talk is empty. But if t star is finite, then you have a, a, some integral Here, Q and P equal to plus infinity with the relation here, the scaling. Okay. So, in fact, this this theorem 
H1 half, this is Fujita Kato. This blow up criteria for the regularity for H1 solution, you can read something like this in the race paper in the 30s. Okay. So this, in fact, this theorem does not really use the, st the whole structure of the equation, but only the scaling. This theorem is true for true for any system of the like this. Okay, there is a sum. Okay, so this is UK here, and you have a Fourier multiplier of order one applied to components like this. Okay. And here this is order one Fourier multiplier. Okay. In particular, this theorem does not take into account the conservation of energy. In fact, there is no energy because this is homogeneous spaces. But it does not take into account neither the, um, uh, the conservation of energy nor the algebraic structure of the equation. Okay, this is very general theorem. So as, for instance, Isabel uh, told um, us yesterday, you can improve the, the space of the initial data, you can improve the, um, uh, the blow-up condition here. So here it's for finite P. And there is a celebrated theorem, much more recent than this result, by Escoriaza Zeregine and Zverak in 2003, that says that this, this blow-up condition B here, B holds for B holds for P equals plus infinity, which means exactly that the supremum limit of u of t in L3 is plus infinity. And this uses very deeply the structure of the Navier-Stokes equation, very deeply. And it, it's, a, it's a, 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 an important and difficult result. And there is new proof by uh, um, Gallagher, Cor, and, uh, and Planchon, and again, you can go into base of spaces in space in, in, instead of R3, but this is not the purpose of the, uh, the talk. So this, this is uh, uh, the landscape for uh, isotropic nothing, no direction are uh, chosen here in this result. Okay? And now, uh, as the, the talk by um, Jörg Wolf and uh, Zetnek uh, Skalak told you yesterday, you can be interested of control some component only in the, uh, of the, um, the solution of the Navier-Stokes equation. And that's uh, the purpose of the, uh, of the talk. So what we are going to, um, to prove, the purpose of the, um, the talk is to prove the following theorem. So we are going to, to put to, to, to make something a little bit more regularity on the initial data. And this theorem justified the, uh, uh, the, the, this talk in the, the conference because it uses the vorticity. So the condition, this is the vorticity omega in 3D, belongs to L3 over 2. And L3 over 2, because of dual Sobolev embedding, this is included in H minus one half. So it implies by bio savar law that the initial data is in H one half. So this is more, a little bit more demanding on the initial data. And with this, if T star is finite, and for P between four and six, then you have for any U a unit vector, you look at the component, you project the vector fields on the unit vector E, you take the H one half plus two over P, you take the LP norm in time, and this blow up. 
So this theorem is proved by Ping Zhang from the Chinese Academy of Science in Beijing and myself. And there is a, a preprint and archive of last year. And what, what does it mean? It means that you have blow up in all directions. You cannot have one direction of the vector field that does not blow up. So another command that with a, a different hypothesis on the initial data, York Wolf proved this theorem for p equal to 4 yesterday. This is exactly for p equal to 4. It was exactly the uh, condition given by uh, York Wolf yesterday. And more recently, and I'm not going to uh, address res this result, if you assume that omega 0 is in L3 over 2 and L2, you have the blow-up condition for any p. And that's a result proved with uh, 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 Ping Zhang, Zifei Zhang, and myself. Okay. And this is, in fact, this is much, m this is much more technical. I don't want to, to address this, but just to what I want to uh, ex I want to explain you the idea of the, the proof of this theorem. But before this, let me make some history. In this direction, the first result uh, has been proved in uh, 99 by Nush Tupa and Penel. And there is, as uh, Jörg Wolf and um, Zdedek uh, Slavak told you yesterday, there is a lot of work with norms that are not scaling invariant. The point here is that the norm we put and the, uh, here, this is a scaling invariant norm. Okay? So this is uh, uh, the, the important point here. So <coughs> let me explain the proof of the theorem. So the idea is to, uh, to use the, uh, the vorticity. And we want to, in fact, see the, um, the Navier-Stokes equation as a sort of mixing of 2D flows, but compressible, which are coupled. So how to realize this? First of all, uh, let me introduce some notation. That small omega, this is the third component of the vorticity which is, uh, in fact, the 2D vorticity, this is D1 V2 minus D2 V1. So I'm sorry, I'm seeing U equal to V in this talk for the time being. And you see, in 2D, you have a uh, very well known, you have the conservation of the vorticity. Okay? And in 3D, what's going on? So if you write to this equation here, you have this. Okay, perfect but you have some error term. And the first, this for 2D flows, it was also for compressible. What do you have for compressible? You have here, you have plus divergence of V omega. But here, let me write it like this. Because of divergence of free vector field, I have this term. And as I'm in 3D, I have some error terms. But the error terms, this is uh, D2 V3, D3 V1, minus D1 V3, D3 V2. Okay? You have this. And the, you have another quantity, which is this is the horizontal divergence of the H. So this is, this is the, the vorticity of the horizontal flow, 2D flow. This is the 2D vorticity. And you have the 2D divergence. But because of the, the divergence free condition global and V, this is this quantity. And I'm going to write this equa the equation of this quantity. So instead, in, in spite of the fact for the ideas, I think this quantity has an horizontal divergence. I re wrote it for because it's much easier to write, write on this type. But the, seeing this, of course, this is this. This is the horizontal divergence. Okay. So, but it's easier to write. So that's really uh, just a question of writing. So you have this. Okay, and you have some terms I'm going to write completely. You have the, the pressure term. What's the pressure term? This is minus d squared square, the pressure. But as we are, we are in the whole space, we can compute the pressure. And the pressure, this is Laplacian minus 1, 
the sum L and M of DL VM DM VL. Okay. And here it goes from one to three. And from now on, Navier Stokes system, this is this system. This one is exactly equivalent to uh, the Navier Stokes system, but we look at this system like this. Here? No, there is no, there is plus here. Yes? Oh, I forgot the, the gradient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. So, the Navier-Stokes equation for us now, this is this. And of course, we decided to prove the theorem that the, we choose the unit vector here as a uh, 0, 0, 1 vector, and 3, this is a uh, we. So, now, uh, we, are, we imagine we control v3. So, now, look at this system, keeping in mind you control v3. What's this system? So, we control v3. Don't take care of the norm for the time being. We control v3. Okay? What is this system? Analyze this system. Oh, here's this equation here. Look at this term in omega. This term is linear. And here, you have some horizontal component here. So, let me introduce notation. So, there is vh. I decompose vh as vh curl plus vh div, so there is nothing original, just to fix the notation. What's vh curl? This is a gradient orthogonal Laplacian, the horizontal Laplacian minus one of omega, and vh div, this is a gradient Laplacian minus one of, so there is minus here, and I put it like this. Okay. This is a way to go from this system to the classical Navier Stokes. Okay? Well. So now here you have a part, the part here, here, the part with V H curl. This is linear with respect to omega. And the other part, this is the forcing term where you have U3. Okay? So you can say perfect. This is linear or forcing term. I can ground wall and I control omega. Okay, and then you can say here, what's the only quadratic term in omega in this equation? The only quadratic term, this is this one. So the question is, I don't want to see any quadratic term in omega. And how to get rid of this, but this is here, how to get rid of it? Simply by doing some energy estimate. But not energy estimate in L2, but energy estimate in a scaling invariant space. So what, the what, what is the scaling invariant space for omega? This is written here. This is 3 over 2. So to treat this equation here, you make some energy estimate in L 3 over 2. But this perfectly, it works perfectly. The model of this, of this equation, what is this? This is simply dA minus Laplacian plus V gradient, equal F. A, this is omega, and F, this is this term. And it's a proposition, it's, not, it's probably classical, but it's, it's not very difficult to prove that you have the following estimate. So I'm going to introduce some notation for A, a alpha, when alpha belongs to 0, 1. A alpha, this is the sign, the sign of A times the, mod, the, the, uh, the absolute value of A to the power alpha. And this is not very difficult to prove that. So I write it like this. It's a choice. So in all this talk, I will write the L3 over 2 estimate as the L2 norm of A to A3 over 4. So this is exactly equal to, okay, 
but this is easier to uh, uh, to write. Okay, that's because you see the reason why is the, the smoothing effect you have. This is the, the point is the smoothing effect, and you will see that the smoothing effect is easier to write. Here you have the gradient. L2 square. This is equal to the initial data plus the integral of F Ft times dt dx. Okay? So to prove this, simply you take the you do this and you make some integration by part in the Laplacian. You have to justify that you have this smoothing effect. If you write this smoothing effect, what it is? This is, in A directly, this is exactly this. This is non-linear non quantity. This is, not, this is not norms. This is norms on some power of A. This is a smoothing effect in the uh, L3 over 2 context. Of course, you have a, a version for P with P uh, bigger than, uh, than 1. Okay, so <laughs> this equation, and you see here, it's okay because here I have a term which is linear in omega or a forcing term. So with this, you can hope to control omega with V3. The equation here, the problem is the norm, that of course the control, it does not give directly uh, the norm here. Don't expect that at all. Okay, I'm going to, to go into the details of this. You cannot expect the reason why is if you write, if you want to write an example of terms here with omega here, what it looks like, you have this. You have D3, what the, for instance, you have gradient H of minus one omega. And you see here, this is very anisotropic. You gain one derivative here, horizontal. You lose one vertical, but it doesn't compensate. Okay. So you are technically you are obliged to really to uh, consider the um, the regularity with respect to the vertical variable differently than the horizontal one. You have no choice just because of this. You see this is very anisotropic. And another way, the reason why the theorem with H1 is delicate, because when you are in H L2 here, only in L2, here you are the homone homogeneous H1 in 2D. And this is an awful space. You see, this is not uh, including the infinity, this is not uh, a Banach space, and so on and so. So you have a lot of difficulty with this. In, in particular, the, the norm, you cannot expect to have some uh, uh, directly the, the norm here. Well, that's the first point. Now, have a look to the second equation. So you need to have some norms on V which is different from the one given here. This is not possible to have this. So analyze the second equation. You control V3 in some norms, and you have control of D, D3, V3 in another norm. What do you want to do? You say, well, OK, I have an equation here. Here, I have, is, uh, all the terms are linear with respect to uh, V3, of course, because V3 is the equation. But here, look at this. Here, you have quadratic terms in omega here. Okay. And don't expect any symmetry that does not disappear at all. So if you try to make something like a fixed point, a contraction argument, you are lost. But you can do an energy. You can do energy. Consider an Hilbert space H, any Hilbert space H, and try to go the evolution of this in H. And imagine your Lapla the Laplacian is, is symmetric for the, uh, the norm on H. You have an energy estimate like this. You have this.
if H is a good Hilbert space. You have this, less than initial data, plus something. Plus, what's going on with the term, with quadratic term? You have here a quadratic term. I'm writing like something like this. You have the bad term, that's a term like this. They are dangerous. But you have this. But here I know I control V3. So it's a quadratic term which controls the quadratic quantity on V3. So it's OK. It's OK. And you can, you can hope to ground wall and to control this norm here with some norm of omega. And here, this is the same you have. If you control V3, but the forcing terms are quadratic with respect to V3, one V3 is, one V3 is controlled by this. The other is controlled by H. And you can close the estimate at the end. You can hope something like this. OK? So now we have to choice to, to have to make the choice of H. The norm of H, Hilbert space, the scaling, no choice. The scaling, this is the derivative of V. H is scaled like H minus 1 half. And it has to be anisotropic because we need anisotropy here. So there is a definition, very classical. So that's. I got the impression to make a sort of uh, easy remake of uh, Isabel Stoke of yesterday. So the definition, H S is prime, very classical. You take the Fourier transform, and you want to have S derivatives in the vertical variable, the horizontal variables, S derivatives in vertical variables, and you have the Fourier uh, of A here. And this, by definition, this is your norm in S, S prime square and is finite. OK? And what I'm going to, cho to choose here, I'm going to introduce H theta, which is simply the space H minus 1 half plus theta minus theta for some theta between 0 and 1 half. So the point here is that all, there are always, the regularities are always negative. Always negative. This is important. Okay. So now, let me write down the uh, the estimates and explain, give some idea of the proof of the uh, estimates. So the first estimate is the estimate on the vorticity omega. So here you have some and here you have not the same coefficient because of course you have some uh, convexity inequality so the, co the coefficient is so this one is just uh, is less than 8 over 9 you have this okay this is less than plus sum integral of this in H theta square. And here you have uh, the power um, I've I have to have uh, 3 over 2, then that's 3 over 4. It's more be you have homogeneity. Okay. This is very important. And here, you have exponential of a constant times the integral of in h 1 half plus 2 over p, p, p. Okay. That's the first estimate. So really, here you see you have the program that you have one part this part, this is really the fact that one part is linear with respect to omega and gives you some ground wall. And here, this is the, the forcing term part. So this comes from the, uh, on the equation here, 
when the parts that you have v1 and v2 are come from the horizontal divergence. That's the reason why you have this term here. This is a forcing term, okay? And if not, you have only Golan rule, okay? So now the point is that you have to control this. And this estimate, the estimate of this, this is really the most, uh, this is the most technical part. I don't want to, uh, uh, to explain. This is, basically, this is law of products in uh, anisotropic spaces. I'm going to write down the estimate anyway, but uh, I hope not to afraid people with this. But anyway, this is the, uh, I don't want to, uh, I will make some explanation of this, which is to my opinion more interesting than the, the second one. So you have this gradient. Right? This is less than the initial data in H theta. Plus, so something huge here, plus a huge integral, plus two integrals. So I'm sorry, it's not very, uh, it's not very pleasant, but I have this times omega. So just when you write it, you say it cannot be pleasant to prove. So. You have these terms here, and you have two uh, minus one over p. This is the first one. You have another integral. No, this is this is rather awful to prove, but I'm not going to say. Uh, I just want to speak about the initial data of this inequality. You have a square here, and you have this. And you have a factor two here instead of one. So here you have this. DT prime. And here you multiplied everything by the, the exponential here. Yes. Here. V3, thank you. Of course, if it's V, uh, it's too easy. <laughs> okay, and you have the exponential of V3, thank you. So here, just a law of products in anisotropic sublet space, convexity, inequality, and pff, algebra of uh, the pr you analyze the pressure terms. It's not uh, the only point I want to address is this one. Why? The initial data satisfies this. This is, I'm, I think, this is some interesting uh, point to do, and I can prove it because it's easy. So here, you see why this quant this quantity is finite. Look at this, this, and this is interesting to see the isotropy, and that's in the same spirit than uh, Isabel told us on scales. But I think it's is, is probably simpler. So um, here, what we want to, uh, to control is this quantity. I want to control this quantity. There is two cases. One case where Xi h is bigger than Xi 3. That's the uh, horizontal derivatives dominate. So you have interest to substitute this one. You put to control this, you substitute this one by Xi 3. What's going on? You have this integral becomes simply Xi 3 and this is exactly V3, H1 half, okay? And in the other case, here you use that this is the horizontal divergence. So in fact, what you have to uh, estimate 
this is this. And when you have horizontal divergence in Fourier space, this is psi h vh psi square. And here, of course, uh, sorry, this is a um, minus sign here, minus, OK? And here, you, in this case, you substitute this one by psi h, it disappears, and you find psi h vh psi square, which again is the h one half norm. Okay, so I like this proof because it's it's simple, and the other point it tells you that even if you are you think you are in h one half, which seems something quiet, in fact you have anisotropic regularity because of the diversion free condition. The diversion free condition gives you a lot of anisotropic regularity on component of V. Okay, this is this is included in the uh, the fact that V is diversion free. Okay, so that it tell you what I only I prove you in this huge inequality is that the first term here is finite. Okay. Well. <laughs> Now, it's impossible to make two things together. So uh, now I'm going to um, give you some uh, ideas of the proof of the inequality on the vorticity. So, so here you see what you have to, to deal with is two terms like this, the model terms. So I choose here the case when horizontal vector fields is associated to vorticity. Okay, just to show you the, uh, so this is omega. You have some d3 here, you have something here, which is d2, v3. And here at the point you have omega one half. So the, the point is that what you measure in the inequality here, um, so maybe it's hidden the inequality, so I'm good. Okay. So um, the inequality, you see, you measure the things. What you you what you, you, you use, you use re sub f regularity on this. That's what gives you with sigma between zero and one. That's what you uh, want to control. And of course, you have a ground wall lemma somewhere. So what we want to, you want to see, this is something like this, there. So here, we can imagine it's not too difficult. But here, one point, one important point is to translate this regularity in a term of regularity of this, OK? In fact, this is uh, and this is very this is crucial because if imagine you make some uh, um, here you make some L2 energy estimates. You have L2 here. Here, this is omega. You can make integration by part. Okay, if you make L2, if you are at the end point, you want to the L2 on omega. This is easy. This is omega, and you can integrate by part and blah blah. But here you cannot. You cannot differentiate this, because what you know, this is this. You have no information of derivatives of this. But you have to try, and you have, instead of integration by part, you have to use some partial regularity, say, a fractional regularity of this, and fractional regularity of this. So what's a good way? For instance, in the earlier spaces, this is very easy. If you imagine that you have a function A, which is C alpha, 
Oh no, alpha is not good. Say C beta with beta between 0 and 1. And you have alpha between 0 and 1. A alpha in C alpha beta. This is not very easy, difficult to prove. OK? And in fact, the same is true for Sobolev space. And what you, you are in the context of base of spaces. So base of spaces, let me uh, uh, say something. You have different definition. So yesterday, we see definition with frequency and with the heat flow for negative regularity. But for positive regularity, you have a, a, a definition which is maybe more classical, defini equivalent definition of B as PQ for S between 0 and 1. This is, you have A, and you translate. You measure the difference between A and some translation of A. But you measure regularity, OK? And P here, this is in LP, you take the LP norm. OK? Regularity, S regularity, what does it mean? It means yeah, you divide by S. OK. And then you take LQ for the measure dy, yd. So this is a, the measure which is invariant under dilation. And this is exactly BSPQ for this. And this is equivalent to the definition with the uh, localization in, um, in, Fourier, uh, in Fourier space. Okay. For instance, it's easy to see that the classical order space, this is P equal Q equal infinity. Order space, this is the base of space for P equal, equal to Q equal to infinity. It gives you exactly the older space. And one lemma which is very which is important, the way to translate the uh, is the following that if you have a function G which is C alpha and you have for S between zero and one, you have a function A which belongs to B S q then g a belongs to b alpha s p over alpha q over alpha you change it of course you change it here of course when p equal q equal infinity it doesn't make any change but here it change so here what's the, what's in our situation what this a this is this and j roughly speaking this is um, r to the power uh, um, fewer two okay uh, two over sorry two over three okay and we imply this you you apply so how to prove this this is exactly almost the same proof as the classical one okay so you measure simply uh, you 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 have the uh, the difference and the, the proof is very elementary see you simply you you write this and you say this is less than okay and then you you see the result you have the result okay and here what does it mean it means that Omega belongs to for any sigma between zero and one, so you cannot go. It doesn't work. This doesn't work for s equal to one. So here you have to make some here for all this. You have this, and you have three three of our three. And this is fundamental because this is the maximum when sigma is almost equal to one. This is the maximum of regularity on omega you can get, uh, of uh, sorry, omega 1 half, you can get for omega 1 half, this is the maximum of regularity, you are almost B3, 2 over 3, 3, 3. And this is very important, this is crucial to estimate term of this type. Then, to go back to uh, anisotropy, 
you know that then these spaces you have almost is here two over three derivatives in L3, something like that. And of course, you can make it anisotropic by simply you have some inclusion like this. When this is included in base of spaces, here this is P1 horizontal S minus alpha. You can put the derivatives horizontally or vertically as you wish for alpha between 0 and S. So here, this is horizontal base of spaces, vertical base of spaces. And then after, you have all the machinery of anisotropic spaces. But it's not, uh, I don't want to uh, enter into these details. And anyway, I have no time. So as conclusion, what uh, if you compare the isotropic case to the anisotropic case here? You can say here, you have Sobolev space. But here, this is uh, Lebesgue space, the good, th the good theorem. So maybe is it possible here to substitute this by Lebesgue space? That's a natural question. And other natural question is that to try to make something, what happens even for h one half when p equals to infinity? Is there something like uh, the um, escoria gathering and Zverac theorem? I don't know. It's probably very different because one important point is this theorem is that when L3 or H1 half is small, this is globally well posed. I don't know if one component is small in H1 half, you have global solution. I don't see exactly how to, uh, to do this. You can try to, uh, to, in this stuff, you can try to assume that, for instance, V3 is small here and try to do something. And you will immediately, this creates, here it creates omega, you have quadratic omega and poof, 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 poof. You have omega here. Omega is, uh, even imagine omega is preserved. Here, immediately, it creates, by quadratic terms here, it creates big V3. So it seems to be uh, uh, difficult and it's, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, I don't know, since I was not here, here yesterday. By the way, this works, yeah. So, uh, I may ask a redundant question. But the first question about this partial regularity, is there some hope to localize it? You know, I take you as I take a subdomain of R3 cross RT, and I assume there that V3 is, or even V3 is in H10, for instance. Is so there a result in this direction? For isotropic uh, uh, results, uh, the philosophy says that the serine criteria for local regularity or criteria for blow up, it's almost the same. In spite of the fact, maybe serine criteria is more difficult to handle with because you have only a weak solution. But okay. it was, you have the same results. So really you should I have I locally the same result. So locally, the results are the same. But the, and then I wonder about is there a relation with this old paper of my, uh, Constantine Maidan Pfefferman? Because if you just make a picture where they say they want the vorticity do not oscillate too much. So if you fix one direction, means it doesn't yes, oscillate too much in, in some sense. Yes, but in this paper, this is a total vorticity. Yeah. This is a total vorticity. So uh, you see, you, what you, you have also in the atropic result that you have results where you, control, you have to control only one, one component of the Jacobian matrix of V, but the results, they are in. Uh, in spaces that are not scaling invariant. Mm -hmm. So the point here, the, the, the point is that the, the space here is in the scaling invariant. Mm -hmm. So this is analogous to the isotropic ones. This is the point. This is really the only point. Yeah. Okay. And just a last comment, just to test the robustness of the method. Now there is this recent paper of Terence Tao 
where I construct an equation where I average the collision operator. It's quite complicated, and it proves blow up. But do you think that if you put the same hypothesis on the partial regularity, you will discuss, it will be a huge piece of work. <laughs> do you so this, he, but the estimate no, team. Here, re really, this is uh, what the key point is the equation of the vorticity. Yeah, okay. So if you remove the equation of the vorticity, I does, say does you, can you can stop with this immediately. Okay. Really, this is uh, the basis, is the idea you see in Avier Stokes, like this. The equation of the vorticity, this is the, the point. Um, so I see how you control V3, so your result is uh, proved here for V3, but for you, you, you claimed it for any unit vector. Yes, yeah, so just it's rotation the invariant, so it's just... Uh, I but, but how do you use the, the divergence? No, no what it's if your question is that the unit vector cannot move, the unit vector okay. is fixed, okay. No, if you can say, for instance, imagine a vector field, not time dependent, but just a fixed vector field that depends on x even very close to uh, one direction. I say, I, maybe it's true, but uh, you see, you have to uh, write some, uh, something equivalent to this in a uh, moving direction. <laughs> Any other question? Okay, if not, let's thank Jean-Yves again. Mm -hmm.